Let's jump straight in then, Steve, shall we? Let's get on with some questions. Yeah, nice classic question that's been submitted on the questions uh, section of school. <laughs> from really? Andrew, <laughs> from Andrew, and it's that classic one. Honey, will honey spike my insulin? I eat raw honey only, two uh, tablespoons or teaspoons a day. It's more of a habit. What damage do you think it would do? Do you want me to go first? Yeah, you go first, yeah. Excellent. So compared to what? So if we look at the research, um, honey is better than than sugar. Uh, And this is where most of the research in regards to honey will come from. Um, I did a rebuttal with Dr. Anthony Chafee to Dr. McCullough's research with Georgie Dinkoff. They released a podcast last year which said that long-term low-carb ketogenic lifestyles were bad for you. which shocked me because Dr. McCullough was always um, a big fan of the low-carb ketogenic lifestyle, um, and he did a complete 180 off the back of this. I think that it's money-driven, but that's my personal opinion. I won't get into that now. But basically, when when you look into the research um, that they put forward, um, a client of mine sent it to me, and I quickly began to rip that research apart with very little effort. So I reached out to, to Anthony, and we both did a, a, a takedown or rebuttal, if you like, on on many of the things that were in this. Um, I didn't know these questions were coming up, by the way. This sounds super rehearsed. And I, uh, Steve's reading the questions. I haven't seen any of the questions, so I didn't know this was coming. But um, we did a podcast on that. Um, take a look at it if you are concerned with long-term, low-carb, ketogenic lifestyles, because one of the questions or one of the arguments in there was that honey was incredibly good for you and it did not spike insulin and so on and so forth. But when you look at the research, they were comparing honey to sugar, to to, to cane sugar and, and, and other forms of, of sugary treats. Um, when we look at the research that compares honey to no honey, there is an insulin response and it's a pretty big one. Um, it, le- it, it will lead to insulin resistance if you over consume honey over prolonged periods of time. Um, and it did increase... Uh, blood glucose levels considerably. Um, now that said, is is that dangerous? And and this this is where it becomes incredibly difficult to navigate because it is very much an individual thing. I'm not anti carbohydrate. Stephen is not anti carbohydrate. We need glucose. Glucose is essential for life. Uh, we can't live without it. But the body makes all of the glucose that we need through that process that we all know and love called gluconeogenesis which is the conversion of protein, lipid, and lactate, and so on and so forth, into into glucose. Um, So we don't need any exogenous form. But that said, it doesn't mean that consuming glucose from an exogenous source is inherently dangerous, because we would have done this during uh, prolonged periods of uh, of starvation, if you like, or, or being without food as we were evolving. We would have eaten anything that we could have, but we would have prioritized, uh, as Stephen um, showed the research recently on one of the lives, at least 80% animal-based, if not more. We only would have consumed vegetables uh, and fruits uh, at specific times of year and when they were available and when meat wasn't available. But we did we did consume some. Um, now, is consuming honey going to be dangerous for you? Well, it depends on, on your metabolic state and, and whether you are metabolically healthy. If you are insulin resistant, then you do not want to be consuming honey um, if you are incredibly fit and healthy, then I don't believe it's going to cause significant damage, but it will still cause damage. Fructose is damaging to the body. Fructose is treated uh, in the same way in the body as cancer is. Uh, it's fermented. Fructose is the only sugar that ferments in the body, and this is what happens with, with cancer cells. Um, if ferment cancer cells will ferment uh, and, and pr- produce lactic acid. Um, so f- sugar is different to fructose. They are they are two different things, and fructose will cause issues in the body if consumed in excess. Um, there is a famous, uh, what what can we call him, um, ex-carnivore, I suppose, who is a, a big advocate of of <laughs> of organ meats and and honey and and other things. You mean Paul Saladino? Uh, yes, that's the one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, won't, I won't mention. I won't mention him. Oh, no, let's not mention it. Um, who? Incidentally, was uh, Chafee was on his podcast recently, and he mentioned about this rebuttal that him and I did with Dr. McCullough and Georgie Dinkoff. 
Uh, and if you watch that on Paul Saladino's channel, um, you'll see Paul, Ad uh, Paul Saladino's face change because it was Georgie Dinkoff who introduced Saladino to this whole idea that um, uh, that putting fruit and onion was a good idea. And basically, in two seconds, Chafee just said, you know, him and this guy, Richard Smith, ripped it apart. Um, so I'm quite surprised he kept it in, but it's there. Go go and watch it. Um, Paul Saladino has got a super active lifestyle. He surfs for many hours per day. Um, so he would have the ability to process uh, any extra toxins, as it were, because sugar is a toxin to the body in excess. Beyond the point that we've used, the amount that is required, it becomes a toxin. This is why we store glucose as a glycogen. Uh, it's not to it's not to build muscle and it's not to run marathons. Uh, it's to save your life. Uh, the glycogen stores or uh, the muscle is nothing more than a dumping ground for uh, glucose in order to save your life. It pulls glucose out of the blood to save your life. Um, so it depends on your metabolic state. I don't consume honey. Um, I find honey, it doesn't work. Even raw honey doesn't work very well for me. Um, and I would personally... My preference is to avoid fructose. Fructose uh, can increase triglycerides. Uh, again, it ferments in the body and it, and it can cause other issues in the liver. And I'm sure Steve will get into more detail in regards to the blood side of this now as we get into it. But I I'm not against honey. I'm not against berries and I'm not against carbohydrate. Um, do we need them? No. Is it going to cause damage? It depends on how healthy you are metabolically. Um, I don't use it. And it's not something that, that I would put in. But look, it is very much an individual answer. And I know that's probably, I know you probably wanted a yes or no answer. It it depends on on how, how healthy you are. It will catch up to Saladino when he stops surfing to no end. Um, I've got no doubt about it. And that's even if he is actually consuming these compounds. Um, because of uh, iron and copper, um, and what what else is there? Iron, copper, um, another another heavy metals that are found within organ meats. Uh, vitamin A being another one. Um, we can offset uh, the toxicity of excess organ meats, and I say that in excess because we can consume organ meats, but excess organ meats can lead to to other health altercations. Uh, this is why we should eat if we are eating organ meats. I believe we should eat it as nature intended. Picture the animal. The animal is predominantly muscle meat. And this is predominantly as a percentage what we'd have eaten. We'd have eaten a small percentage of the organs in comparison to the muscle meat. Um, so eating carbohydrate will reduce the toxicity of some of these heavy metals, which I believe is probably another reason that, that Saladino has introduced this. Because, as you know, he has a supplement range uh, that sells organ meat supplements. Uh, and I'm not saying that organ meat supplements are bad for you, um, you know, quite the opposite. But if you want the vitamins and minerals from from organ meats, you know, eat eat organ meats. I understand that some people can't. And, and I am I own a supplement company, so I'm all for supplementation in, in these situations. Uh, but there's a bit of background and some, uh, some, some extra information to go along with your decision making. Whether you eat honey or not is is up to you. Great answer. Thanks, everybody, for um, turning up to the later uh, live, by the way, so that we had a poll and it was something like four or five to one uh, in in favour of doing this later time. So I just want to thank people. Susan, I see your hands up. We're just doing a couple of questions off the uh, school website where they um, posted them like two days in advance. And then we'll get into the room questions as well. I do. I will answer the question we just had. Sorry, Rich. Yeah. Can we jump on to Susan's question first, Steve? Is that Okay. Uh, well, we can, but we have been asking people to put questions yeah. on the website as well. But look, okay, we'll come yeah. to that. Can I answer the honey one? Yes, by all means. Yeah, yeah. Will honey spike my insulin? Right. Um, yes. Will you know how much? Susan, we'll come to you. Just want to answer it. So, yes, I'm going to break it down, Andrew. Will honey spike my insulin? Yes, but we don't know by how much. Why doesn't it show so much on a glucose monitor? Uh, because it isn't just glucose. It is also fructose. So we don't know what fructose is going to do to the liver. I eat raw honey only two teaspoons a day. Okay, right. Two teaspoons is two teaspoons more than your bloodstream requires. So roughly speaking, we have about five, five and a half liters of blood. And we want one teaspoon of sugar in that. And the body is only really happy when it's about one teaspoon or about four grams. 
So if you have two teaspoons, you have now increased the sugar glucose load by over double, maybe triple. And your body has got to deal with that. So yeah, how's it going to deal with that? It's going to raise your insulin. Uh, it's more of a habit. What damage do you think it would do? Well, if you're having it out of habit, then stop it. It's a bad habit. <laughs> it really is that simple. Um, because there's no vitamins or minerals or nutrients in honey that you can't get from meat. But there is plenty in meat that you uh, can't get from honey. So it's uh, it's just a sweet taste. It's a sweet taste on your tongue, cephalic response. Right, here's the other proviso. If only two teaspoons of honey a day keep you carnivore 100% the rest of the time, and if you didn't have two teaspoons of honey, you were going to go off the rails and have donuts and pizzas and stuff like that, and that's how Richard started the question, uh, his answer, then two teaspoons of honey is better than that. So that's how we frame it. We don't tell anyone you can't do or you can do or you should do, you shouldn't do. We just say these are the facts and you can take those facts and then you can adapt them into your way of living. Uh, Rich does the science and I do the sort of little layman's bit at the end or the beginning. So, yeah, okay. Uh, as Richard has wanted Susan with her hand up to ask the question. Susan, ask her question, please. Uh, yes, yeah, my question is uh, for Richard. Recently, he did an interview with uh, Dr. Noakes of South Africa. And during the interview, he mentioned that he goes to sleep with meditation music. What is that? What frequency are you referring to? Hey, Susan, how are we doing? You okay? Very well, thank you. Good, good. Looking forward to our next catch up now shortly. Um, yeah, so the, the meditation music that I use, uh, the frequency will vary depending on what what I'm looking for. Uh, if I feel I'm struggling to sleep, I'll look for a frequency to aid with relaxation and sleeping. If I feel that I'm overtrained, I will look for something to heal and repair. Um, but sometimes you can you can do ones that have dual frequency. Uh, and I know this sounds hoo ha. You know, it, it's probably in the same realms as uh, as grounding. You know, but this is heavily science based. Also, um, I find that it works incredibly well for me to help me sleep and 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 repair. And it's 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 everything, isn't it? It's I think first and foremost, nutrition is the biggest lever we can pull. And I believe that to be ninety five plus percent of health and well being, uh, because living this way allows us to detox and and do all the other things that and fight off all of the other toxins that we are surrounded by. These other things, grounding, red light therapy, cold water dipping, um, you know, this meditation music, so on and so forth. These are all those 5%, in, in my opinion. Uh, I'm sure other people would argue that the percentage would be the other way around, for, depending on which profession they're in. But um, but look, it's, yeah, th th that's what I listen to. It depends on what I'm doing. I'll go onto YouTube um, and I'll just search for, uh, you know, a certain free, a high frequency meditation music for healing uh, and I'll just, they're usually around 10 hours long. So I'll just play that. I'll put the, I'll put it on my mobile, but I'll put the mobile at the other end of the room because I'm, I'm funny about signals and, and frequency coming from the phone. So it's on quite loud. Um, but I, th I think it works incredibly well. So give that a try. Excellent. Excellent. That's really good. Uh, right. So we'll go back to the, um, pre loaded questions. Um, do you worry about meat quality stroke sourcing? Meat is expensive where I live. How much should I worry about grocery store beef that may be old or somehow treated with chemicals or something? Should I rearrange uh, Should I rearrange my budget to accommodate locally raised meats? I have an expensive horse hobby, so I kind of hate to spend a lot of money on food. So I kind of hate to spend a lot of money on food. Thanks. Do you want me to jump in first? Yeah, go for that. Yep. Perfect. So look... Any animal protein is going to be more beneficial than no animal protein. During testing, um, non or grain-fed beef, when we look at the, the nutrient density compared to grass-fed beef, there is a difference without question. Um, but the difference in regards to what is found in grain-fed beef is still considerably better than any other form of uh, vitamins and minerals and amino acids found in vegetables, for example. We need we need the vitamins and minerals from animal proteins. Um, there are some to preference over others. Um, pork, for example, um, isn't so high in in B12. Um, they have to be fed B12. 
uh, whereas cattle will pick it up from grazing grass and so on and so forth. And if they're not, they're given uh, cobalamin tablets, um, which cows make uh, cobalamin from cobalt, by the way. And that's probably a talk for another day. Uh, but any animal protein is going to be healthier than the no animal protein. So if that's all your budget will account for, then fantastic. Um, supermarket meats, um, it depends on... Uh, where, where's the question coming from, Steve? UK-based or stateside? Uh, this is Adrian. So it's don't... American. American. Right, okay. So I mean, in the UK, um, th- there are a few uh, supermarkets that will stock good quality meats. Um, those are things like Lidl and Aldi in the UK. Um, you know, I don't know what the equivalent would be, or maybe they, they exist in the States. I'm unsure. Um, but you can find good quality meats from uh, you know from the supermarkets. Uh, Preference locally sourced, grass fed if you can. Um, look, we all need hobbies, and you know I'm I'm in no position to tell someone what they should do or not do, uh, you know, with with their money. Um, but for me, health and well being is, is always number one on my list. Um, it, I'm wearing my vest because I've just been running. By the way, I don't go to the office like this every day. I promise. But um, so you know. I, I do running when I can. Uh, I try to keep fit and healthy, but nutrition always comes first. So all of my my meats are locally sourced, grass fed, grass finished. Um, I'm incredibly uh, picky in regards to where my meats come from. But if I'm out and about, if I'm on the road and I need to stop somewhere for food, then I will lower the standards, you know, per se, in, in regards to what types of meats that I will consume because some meat is better than no meat. Um, so just do what you can. But locally sourced grass fed is always going to be better. But grain fed, anything, and any any form of animal protein, even if it has had chemicals and all sorts put in, is still going to carry a significant benefit comparative to things like vegetables and, and other anti-nutrients. Yeah, that's great. Um and I would just say exactly what you've just said. The best, the best quality you can get for your budget is the best thing to do. Interesting. Uh, if you are looking at looking after your horse, and you want your horse to be optimal, I bet you get the best food you possibly can get for your horse. Which is not me being um, funny. It's just to help you frame how you think about things, because you are very important to the horse. So uh, try and just weigh it up that way as well. And I would personally, uh, you know, you say in America, it's probably easier to find good quality meat actually than it is in the UK on mass. So on the, you know, like Costco, for instance, I would imagine their suppliers are better in the, in the states than in our from our supermarkets. But I think we sort of win with local farmers basically. So it, 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 you know, swings and roundabouts. Right. Next question uh, from Jake. Jack, I think it's Jacqueline, I think, actually. Hi, both. I would like to understand why in the keto carnival space that there is an emphasis on glugging gallons of water. Also, is it a myth that it is not good if your urine runs as clear as water? Well, that's... uh, No, not a myth. I mean, basically, if your urine is clear, you are drinking too much water. You've got to think about these things that come out of your body as waste. They're not gold, then they're not things that your body wants. It doesn't want it, all right? So uh, it should have some sort of color in it, you know, urine being clear when we do urine tests. And don't forget, I did 15 years in rehab and we did private blood tests. If the water is clear, it, you're just flushing out all your electrolytes and everything. It, you, you're drinking too much water. So why is there an emphasis on glugging gallons of water? Because it's a misconception. Is there? <laughs> Well, I know, I know this has obviously come from somewhere, but it's um, yeah, it it's one that I think's been overplayed, isn't it? I mean, it's um, I, I don't consume an awful lot of water. I'll be honest; I probably consume less than I'm told to, and you're probably yeah. the same, I think, Steve. Yeah, we say drink to thirst. You know, why would we say eat when you're hungry, but drink when you're not thirsty? Does that doesn't make any sense? So Mike just had a big glug of drink there. I've I've got my drink here. I'll have a sip. But I won't sip it because I have to or because this is my eighth glass and I've got to finish it by nine o'clock tonight. Because that's not what thirst is. Thirst is, is, is what it is. And all this stuff about once you're thirsty, you are dehydrated is not true. The body would not be that stupid. 
It really wouldn't. It would say, right, you're thirsty. You need to go and find some water. Take out the supermarkets. Take out all the abundance of water and think, what would happen to humans if they were sitting somewhere where there was no water and they went, well, I'm thirsty. I'm really thirsty. I'm dehydrated. There's no point now going looking for water. It doesn't make any sense. Um, the eight glasses of water a day came from the 1950s, and there was a military study by this chap called Ansel Keys. Don't boo, don't hiss, because uh, he did do some good studies, and this was one funded by the military. They wanted to send the military out into battle and they wanted to know what is the minimum because they were tight but also trying to be efficient what is the minimum a soldier needs over 24 hours and it worked out to be about two liters or eight glasses of water um so you think well Stephen, you're talking out of your rear end you just said that's what needed no because in the report it said but you do not have to take water because you will get that from the food you eat simple as that so like a ribeye is 70 percent water, water. Yeah. yeah so you don't need to glug lots and lots of water just drink to thirst now we also do stupid things like train too hard run too fast don't we rich run too f- <laughs> too Fight far too. <laughs> yeah and <laughs> you use more energy and you obviously sweat and stuff like that so replacing water that is uh disrepor- disproportionate to what a normal person would do during a normal day that's totally fine so if you're running a marathon of course you're going to go to the water station and drink some water because you're sweating and but it would still be better to have electrolytes in and now i'm going to hand over to rich with that nice little segue into talking about what hydration actually is so look i think you've covered it there steve but jack jackie it is isn't it i think jackie yeah you've got your hand up do, do you want to jump in on i think if you've ever got more questions by the way. Hi, everyone. Um, so, yeah, what you just said makes sense. I've always thought it's a bit, I've been always been a bit suspicious of the whole, because you, look at what, we're always told, oh, you know, making comparisons to lions, lions, for example. Well, look at my dogs. They'll take a big glug of water throughout the day when they need to, but they're not doing it constantly. However, I've been getting leg cramps of pretty bad leg cramps and every bit of research I've done has said drink more water, drink more water, take electrolytes, drink water, take electrolytes and so that's what I've been doing and when I do that they don't seem as bad so I mean like this like oh, do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah so I think I mean th- there's you know when we talk about the volume of water also it is very much individual you know so you know you may you may not be consuming enough. I was a stickler for not consuming enough water. Um, I drink a lot more water now because I'm adding electrolytes. But hydration isn't just about water. It's about hydrating with with electrolytes, which we can get from foods. So this isn't a sales pitch in regards to electrolytes. Um, but I that, that's what I use throughout the day. Is the and as you know, I I, I make electrolytes. Um, and I've made them to 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 what I believe to be the highest quality available anywhere in the world. And I won't bore you with the science behind that. Um, it is very much individual. We can get all of the electrolytes that we need from from our, our animal proteins, um, but in order to do this to to to, to thrive, um, we would need to be consuming connective tissue from the bone, uh, the knuckles off the chicken bones, um, lots of fish bones. Uh, we'd need to be consuming bone broth, beating, smashing the bone, and eating the marrow, and so you know things that we would have done during our evolutionary period, uh, eating organ meats, again, for example. Um, but we don't, we tend not to do this in, in modern life. Um, it's, and there, there are lots of carnivores out there who will advocate not for using electrolytes. Anthony Chafee, for example, doesn't use electrolytes. Um, he obviously gets enough from his diet. Although what I would add to that is that he doesn't do any excessive training. Um, if we flip over to Sean Baker, then Sean, Sean Baker is an, an Olympic um, not Olympic, he's a world record rower, um, built like a big person, <laughs> absolutely muscle bound, isn't he? And he, he swears by electrolytes. So it is very much individual. Um, you know, you need to do what works for you, but h- hydration is important, but it isn't solely to do with water. When it comes down to cramps, cramps are usually caused by an imbalance in electrolytes. Um, and it's usually... What we, if if you if you were to Google this, it will tell you that it's a, a magnesium deficiency. 
But in fact, what it is, is it's a, it's a usually a surplus of calcium. So it could be one or the other or a combination of both because dietary calcium depletes magnesium. They compete for absorption. So the more calcium that we consume, uh, the, the less magnesium that is, is available within the body. And the ratio that the cells in the body need are roughly one to one. It is slightly different, to, but it's pretty close to one to one. Um, everything that we eat carries a lot of calcium. An egg, for example, is around 24, 25 milligrams of calcium. Um, I've got this this mineral water. Um, and I... Quiet, please. Sorry, my little girl in the background, you're bipping at me. Um, I've got uh, on this, it says 107 milligrams per litre, um, which is an awful lot. So that basically, there's nearly 60 or 55 grams or so of, of calcium within this compared to 35 magnesium. So, so instantly, my ratio is going to be out. Um, beef contains calcium. All of the animal proteins we eat contain calcium. Um, it's incredibly easy, especially if we're consuming things like cheese and raw dairy and butter. It's, it's very easy to get to you know, 500 uh, uh, milligrams plus of calcium per day. And we don't really want to be consuming in excess of 500 because all of the studies in regards to, to calcium uh, consumption from supplementation and from diet alone show that we can increase our risk of cardiovascular disease by as much as 15% with excessive calcium consumption. And by excessive, I mean anything over 500. If you were to look at the the amount of meats and things that you consume within the day, it's easy to see how how quick we can build that calcium amount up. And sometimes the magnesium, because we're not eating, you know, the um, the, the, the all of the items that I just mentioned, which would be higher in ca- in magnesium, also the connective tissue, the things on the bones, organ meats, the balance is sometimes shifted. So we can we can rectify this by either reducing calcium or by increasing magnesium to put that ratio back to close to to one to one. Um, so you know, does your diet? You know, consist of you know, eggs and cheese and butter and and you know things that would be eggs, eggs and butter, not cheese. I'm yeah, I'm not. I'm trying to reduce the eggs and just go more meat. But I mean, I'm pretty good on this. I just good. do meat, eggs, and butter and tallow. Fantastic. So look and um, a tin of sardines. So I'm now worried that I'm getting too much calcium. And so look, I <laughs> the last thing I want to do is is throw these what what I try to do is give as much information in an answer as I can so you can make educated decisions but if you're eating animal proteins and nothing but you, you go you're going to be a lot fitter and healthier than you were if you weren't consuming these foods especially if you're now devoid of eating um excessive amounts of of plant compounds and things and again if, if for any of you who are on the call who are living you know a, a keto predominant based lifestyle that side, that, you know, that that's what I do. I'm all I'm all for um, healthy living, no matter where it comes from, whether it's low carb, whether it's dirty keto, clean keto, more animal based carnivore, so on and so forth. But the healthiest way that we can live is by at least predominating animal proteins. And I do genuinely believe that eating beef and lamb, um, you know, with salt and water, and making sure our electric balance is right. Th- th- I believe that to be the healthiest way to live. It doesn't mean that you have to live that way, and I don't want you to fear consuming eggs. You know, or cheese or butter for that matter, because these are all still very important. Choline from, from eggs allows us to make acetylcholine and, and produce neurotransmitters and is part of um, uh, the, the production of cholesterol, which is essential for every cell function in the body. So these these things are important. I wouldn't fear the amount that you're getting from, from there. Just be conscious maybe of trying to combat the leg cramps, uh, maybe by increasing the calcium. What you could do is just track what you're consuming, but... If you live in this way, you know, I, I don't want you to fear consuming. I eat about six eggs a day, you know, um, most days. Um, but I also consume lots, lots of magnesium from the electrolytes that, that I drink, you know. Um, don't but, fear consuming eggs. They're, they're highly nutrient dense, unless you have a tolerance, obviously. Well, I mean, when the cramps are like they were the other night, sat, uh, for. Friday night, so I did a workout in the morning. They seem to be worse on the days that I've been to the gym. Okay. Uh, so bad. I was waking up like every 20 minutes in the night. I didn't get any sleep because they just, they were so bad. And I couldn't, um, the only way to get rid of them is to walk around. Yeah. And it eats off. Then I get back in bed and then it comes back again. It's just like a nightmare. And I'm just like, what, you know, what, how, what is 
causing this and you just said that so now I'm in the predicament of like well, what do I do because I have the butter to increase to get enough butter. butter and I can't always get my hands on enough tallow so so look it's d- don't overthink things there's there's an issue um so for, for most people who are not suffering with these problems it's fine there's another factor to this that if if you're fairly new to this way of eating your muscle glycogen how long have you been living this way roughly oh. right so incredibly new so what happens initially is that we come from a state of of in, increased insulin regardless of what point we start when we begin the lifestyle insulin drops and then it signals the kidneys to release sodium from the body uh, from four points in the nephrons in the kidney um, wherever sodium goes, water follows. So you're losing water um, it, it, in the first couple of weeks to the first few months in excess. Um, so consuming more water in your case could be why you're benefiting from that because you are replacing lost fluid. So you've got considerably less water in your muscles, which is going to lead to cramping problems. The beauty of this is as you adapt, the body adjusts and, and these things, if if that's what it is, will go away naturally. And it doesn't even have to be a magnesium or calcium issue. Um, salt, putting salt back in. Um, so I don't know if you salt in your meals or do, do you even do, do you take electrolytes at all? Do you... Brilliant. Okay. How many servings a day? Two. Two. Okay. So that's five, so 10 grams a day. Just for the sake of trialing something, try upping it to a, an extra serving over the next couple of days and, and see if that alleviates it. Or what you could also do is just salt your meals with, with, with excessive amounts of salt. Put more salt on there uh, preferably from well i've obviously been doing either doing it on the water <laughs> so what's an excessive amount of salt i don't want to lie in time so <laughs> just, just um s- normally what i'd suggest is salt into taste um just add a little bit more or what you could do is, is salt your meals to taste and just add some salt in water once or twice a day just to because if you, if you are correcting that sodium imbalance then that may cure the problem, and then you don't even have to worry about magnesium and calcium. That may even not it may even not be the cause because you're new to it, and insulin's dropped, and you're devoid of sodium. So it could even be just a sodium problem. Um, don't get over concerned with with not eating eggs. Eggs are highly nutrient dense. If you don't have an intolerance to them, I would always recommend keeping them in um, incredibly nutrient dense. Um, so just try more salt for the next couple of days, and um, and see. Third fit with the fact that I that it's worse on the days I've been, I've gone to the gym. Yeah, because obviously you're, you're going to be dehydrated further from one. I sweat a lot in the gym though. You know, I don't really go that mad. So right. for, to create energy, for, for me to do this, um, we we need to create ATP, and to do that, we need to use something called the electron transport chain. And during that process, we use electrolytes. So you know whether. We get electrolytes from foods and so on and so forth. We we can't live without electrolytes. Electrolytes are electrically charged minerals that allow the body to to do its work, to move and function. So if you're moving more in the gym, you're using up more electrolytes. And if in the gym, it's going to be predominantly, um, it's going to be sodium and potassium for the sodium potassium pump. Um, and you are going to use some calcium and magnesium also, uh, but but at different rates. So if you are moving more you're going to be using more of those electrolytes. So just consuming a little bit more salt even on those days may alleviate that problem. So there's a number of things it could be, but the eggs thing, I mean, I'd leave that till the very last thing because I, I, now that you've just said that you're, you know, you're, you're four weeks in, I think it's more to do with a sodium issue over being anything else. So don't be concerned about the eggs for now. We, we, we'll come back to that next week. You know, tr- try increasing the salt for the week. And then next week we'll touch base, and you can say yes, it's, it's better, or no, not at all. And and we can we can implement a change from there. How does that sound? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. And with the water, just drink when you're thirsty. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, simple as that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you very much. No but problem. isn't it funny? It is a little funny when you say that because that makes such obvious sense, doesn't it? It's like eating when you're hungry. Uh, because if you flip it and you say, oh, so why should I eat when I'm not hungry? It's like, no, why would you do that? Well, there's also that thing, isn't there, about the big um, the old big drinks companies wanting us to buy all the bottled water, don't they? So, yeah. Absolutely, yes. Well, I think, I think that question might help Gemma, who's also posted a question. 
Um, as discussed yesterday, and I think Gemma came to our live question and answer session on YouTube or on Rumble, uh, I'm very much feeling the effects of my body adjusting to the transition into a carnivore diet. <laughs> Next question is really common. Is there anything I can do or anything I can take that will speed up my body adjusting uh, and speed up the healing process? I'm already using Richard's amazing electrolytes. Is there anything you can speed it up? The adaptation process, yes. There's there's a number of things that we can do. Um, the adaptation process, and just for a bit of background, and I, w- I won't bore you guys too much with it, but the body creates three different types of ketones, uh, acetoacetate, acetone, and beta-hydroxybutyrate. Um, acetoacetate is interchangeable, not that you need to know that, but acetone is quite often wasted. But what we want is beta-hydroxybutyrate. Um, when we start, so um, Jackie, for, for, for instance, now being a couple of weeks in, um, she's going to be wasting acetoacetate and acetone and not uh, actively producing and utilizing beta-hydroxybutyrate. It takes a long time. Uh, it can take anywhere between 12 weeks to 12 months to to upregulate the ability. We can become fat-adapted within like 12 weeks, to be, but to become keto-adapted and utilize ketones at a preferential rate can take a lot longer. Um and it's to do with upregulating specific pathways and enzymes. There's a pathway in particular called the monocarboxylate transporters and enzymes that you guys have probably been mentioning a lot lately, uh, BDHA, CAT, and SCOT, which exist in, in the liver and muscle and the cells and allow us to transport ketones and utilize them at the target cell. Um, we can upregulate this transition of those monocarboxylate transporters and these enzymes uh, to do it naturally. Uh, we can do hit style training, so high intensity workouts, short bursts, things like sprinting, um, which last night on the live we, we mentioned as being one of the better ones. But there is a caveat to this. If you're new to running, I don't suggest you just start by sprinting because you will injure. Uh, things like rowing and uh, you know uh, any uh, turbo training, things with the air bikes or the air, uh, um, the turbo train or the air bike might be uh, another alternative. Um but high intensity training will upregulate the, those adaptations. And interestingly, the monocarboxylate transporters are the same transporters used by hormones. So we have ho- better hormone production. So it's ideal to upregulate these. Um, so that's one thing you can do, which involves a lot of effort, but it is fantastic. Um, you can take C8 MCT, caprylic acid. Um, which again I make, and this isn't a sales pitch. You've asked a question, so I'll tell you. This is why I produce and stock these products. C8, and a quick Google search will show you this. Caprylic acid uh, will upregulate the, the monocarboxid transporters and its ability to create ketones, whether you are ketogenic or not. So if you were to take MCT, particularly C8, it will increase ketones in the body, and so will exogenous ketones. These work as signaling molecules within the body, and they tell the body that this is a new energy source. We're already using BHB. Let's start ramping up the production of the MCTs and 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 these these other enzymes associated with it. Um, so you you can use those, and you can you can use them whether you were ketogenic or not. Just as a side note as well, the the C8 that that I produce is by certification the world's highest purity. So there's no one. Uh, better than me anywhere on the planet and that is that is by certification and you could check that out and i'm one of the cheapest also um so you can use mct or bhb to do that or high intensity training or both um or just grin and bear it just stick with it and those adaptations will come just remember this is all about the rule and not the exception the the more strict that we can be the, the quicker those adaptations are going to come if you are struggling um this is something Stephen and I mentioned recently also. You may may even want to consider maybe taking a step back towards being ketogenic over carnivore. Um, Stephen and I didn't wake up being carnivore. You know, we began this through low carb, uh, incremental changes, which saw us gravitate. And Stephen and I didn't know each other till we were carnivore, but we've both had a similar story in regards to, you know, curing health problems and so on and so forth. Uh, but we did so by being low carb initially, and then we became sort of dirty keto, standard keto, clean keto. You, you, the longer that you live the lifestyle, the more you adapt, the more strict that you become. But it, it is sometimes easier to do that because your body is going to go through a detoxification phase. You're going to be oxalate detox, detoxing for for, uh, for for one, um, and keeping in specific compounds that contain oxalates can can lower um, your um, your susceptibility or the the effects 
of of releasing those toxins. So sometimes maybe taking a step back and being slightly less strict by but by remaining you know in a ketogenic state because carnivore is still a ketogenic state. Um, so there's a there's a few things there, Gemma. Um, uh, I, I know you're on the call and and uh, and off screen, but um, a couple of things. There's a, there's a few uh, food foods for thought, uh, pun intended. Um, try some of them. You know, try. I know that you're in the gym and stuff. Maybe try some hit workouts and go on, Gemma. Fire away. Yeah, sorry. Um, I just wanted to say, obviously, my the symptoms aren't horrendous, but I think because when I first started keto. I had like a week or so and I felt like amazing and I know that that's possible so I'm a bit like I'm really itching to get back to that I guess um but yeah like you say I do quite a lot of exercise I'm currently training for high rocks um and I have tried the MCT oil but it didn't agree with me um wonder if the powder might be any better yes so that's what I've got in there so I've got MCT powder and BHB in there Um, MCT powder is far better on on the gut Um, again as we start to come into this lifestyle again excessive amounts of fats in any form uh, increases bile production and because the body is inefficient at at seeing and uh, processing that volume of bile uh, it's meant to be reabsorbed in the small intestine but it ends up in the lower gut and it ends up with you know gastro distress um powder seems not to do this so you could try for the powder um possibly give it and that, again that's not a sales pitch whether you buy it or not it, it doesn't bother me but it's um it, it is a fantastic compound if you know it's there if, if you want to try it but high rocks is perfect training for high intensity i've i've actually thought about competing in high rocks myself but um there we are that's a talk for another day yeah the hardest part is getting the tickets <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah that's right yeah I think I do well in there, coming from a strength background, and and now gravitating into um into speed work with running and cycling. But anyway, I won't bore everybody else with that. <laughs> we can uh, we can touch base now. So, Gemma, does that help? Does that give you enough to take away? Yeah, no, that that's very helpful. Thank you very much. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to point out to Rich, it's not the twenty four hour live stream tonight, mate. Sorry. So, <laughs> I'm joking. That was my subtle way of plugging the seventh of July. 8 a.m. start for our 24-hour live stream. Therefore, you will not uh, miss out if you have a question because we've got, we've got no excuse. We've got 24 hours in a row. And also, um, if you become a member, a paid member of the school community, your questions will be prioritised for all the guests. So um, that's something to look forward to. Uh, Susan there, by the way, um, we've got some good news for you. And we'll we'll email you later to thank you for your support with us. All right. So anyway, uh, let's go back to the question, Mike, here. Uh, back in 2015, the American Dietary Guidelines noted cholesterol is not a Did. nutrient of... Sorry, go on. <laughs> That's all right. That's okay. You've got to remember this goes out as an audio as well. So I have to be very clear here. Right, here we go. Back in 2015, the American Dietary Guidelines noted cholesterol is not a nutrient of concern for overconsumption which I often used as a point when those on the SAD diet argued with me. However, the current guidelines no longer include that statement. and Once again, say foods high in cholesterol should be limited. What do you make of that change? Money. <laughs> yeah, it, yes. yeah that, that, that statement was hidden on the website. Um, I don't know if it's still there, but it wasn't in plain view. You, you had to hunt that statement down. Um, I'll tr- I'll go back on and see if I can find it because it wasn't on any main page. Um, it was it was a statement on a, on a not a hidden page but a page that probably doesn't get seen or read very often. Um, but it was there, um, and it's highly noted. And maybe because it's everywhere now, um, they probably noticed that sales in uh, sugary treats has taken a tumble. Uh, you know these these establishments are heavily funded by the sugar industry. Um, yeah, there's lots of money to be lost for health. There's no profit in a healthy patient, unfortunately. Um, even in the UK, you know, we have the NHS and we think that this, this is free. We pay for this through our national insurance um, and, and so on and so forth. So we, we are paying for it. And, and the doctor, the surgery that you go to in the UK that gives you medication that you think is free, that surgery is being paid to, to issue that medication. I'm not saying that they're doing it, you know, uh, with any um, uh, ill intent, the doctor has your best interest at heart, but they are trained in medication. If you go in to, to see a doctor with a headache, 
they'll offer you a headache pill. If it's depression, it's an antidepressant. If it's inflammation, it's an anti-inflammatory, so on and so forth. Um, they're not trained in looking at the root cause. They don't have time. Um, and the root cause is quite often is nutrition, but there's no profit in a healthy patient. In fact, this whole system of, of the doctors uh, and the NHS uh, throughout the world came from the Rockefeller es- establishment. Doctors used to train their own apprentices and they would train the apprentice. They would pay the apprentices as, as they were being trained and learn their craft. Uh, and then uh, the Rockefeller establishment realized that they could monetize this and charge people to, 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 to pay to train. This is where like student loans and all the debts came from. And they've monetized a whole health system, which wasn't monetized previously. And it's now one of the most profitable uh, establishments you know, anywhere in the world. Uh, and again, that is a fact. You can Google that. Um, so money, it comes all it's all of the money, unfortunately. And we, we will never win. You know, we, we put this information out there. We are never going to say that we've, you know, this is never going to be mainstream, however hard we try, unfortunately, but it is growing. And I think if each and one of us lives the lifestyle and confers that benefit that it is, Stephen, just for you, um, <laughs> he hasn't even noticed, never mind. Um, if we live this lifestyle and we reap a benefit and we tell a, a, a family member or a friend and they notice it's that pebble in, in the water, the pebble in the pond, that ripple effect, uh, and it, it will grow, but it'll never be mainstream. So, I, Mike, I think it's it's financially driven, personally. Yeah, I think so too. I was actually just looking up what chat GPT would say. Why have they removed it? But why did the dietary guidelines remove the statement that cholesterol is not a nutrient of concern? And uh, the long and the short of it is things like organizations like the American Heart Association and the National Lipid Association continue to recommend limiting dietary cholesterol, particularly for those of high blood pressure and high blood cholesterol or a history of heart disease. They argue that many high cholesterol foods such as fatty meats and full fat dairy are also high in saturated fat, which are known to increase cardiovascular risk. You see, now you could interrogate ChatGPT and actually find that is all just smoke and mirrors. And, uh, that, you know, if you did, if I went three layers in, they would eventually say there is no evidence of any of the things we've just said. They would say that. Uh, but who's going to? Who's going to do that? Probably 19 people in this room <laughs> out of 56 million uh, people in, the, in in England. But, yeah. What do I make of it? I think it's scandalous. That really do. Right. Uh, Rich, we have another question, I think, uh, which is from Lisa. I've been carnival for one year. I'm only eating beef, lamb, sardines and bacon. Uh, yeah. Why am I still getting a white film on my tongue, indicating the presence presence of candida? Could it be... The bacon or the fact that the beef that I'm eating is not grass fed and finished. Could the cows being could the cows be being fed grains mean that I'm in fact consuming some type of carbs? Yeah, quite possibly. Um, you know, the bacon could be the issue there, possibly, um, because it's aged. Um again, and this isn't a this isn't a sales pitch, I promise, but MCTC eight is uh is being shown to reverse the effects of candida incredibly quickly. Um, but you can try through dietary intervention. Try taking the bacon out to start with. Um, you know, it, it, let's let's try that. But you know, try brushing the tongue also. You know, brush the teeth and brush the tongue. Um, that might even alleviate it. it. It could just be a case that you're noticing now, whereas maybe, you know, you didn't notice so much before. But I, I brush the teeth, I brush my tongue. I don't use toothpaste. Um, sometimes I'll use coconut oil or MCT oil. Um, but more often than not, I just wet a brush and brush my teeth. And the reality is that's all you need. Um, we don't want excessive amounts of fluoride contrary to popular belief, but that's probably a talk for another day. Any thoughts, Steve? Well, yeah, you see, it isn't necessarily a sign of candida anyway. It could just be irritants. So tobacco, vaping, uh, alcohol, all of that can do that because it's not something that uh, your body wants lots of. Uh, medications, antibiotics can just dis- disrupt the balance of the bacteria in the m- mouth. So lots and lots of different things. You can have uh, just debris. Like you say, I would use, I would actually brush my tongue. I think that's going to make a big difference straight off because many people don't do that. Um, if they haven't got pain or any other problems with it, that's that's what I would do. If you have pain, that's something you should get checked out. Right. That's a great question, though. Thanks, Lisa. Um and hopefully that was a great answer. We are 
we're past our 45 minutes. Are we carrying on till the end of the hour? Yes, let's go to the hour. Okay, right. Okay, Helen is saying, I was talking to my 14-year-old daughter about Keto Carnival, way of eating tonight. She asked me about fruitarians, vegans, vegetarian, and why isn't it healthy eating these diets? She asked me, how do you know that eating carnivore is healthy? At school, they are still being taught the pyramid food diagram as a healthy diet. Any tips, Stephen Richard, to tell her she is listening tonight? Well, she's still awake, I wonder. Yeah, so look, I'm going to... I'm going to find something. I'm going to share my screen. Um, the long and the short of it is that the food pyramid, the eat well plate, um, were designed and paid for by sugar companies. And again, that is a fact. I did a podcast with Zoe Harkoon recently. We went into the funding, where the funding came from behind the food pyramid. And it came from, from 10 businesses. Those 10 businesses are directly correlated to every major brand in the world. Um, these brands owned sub-brands, or you know, the other brands that you wouldn't know were connected. So these 10 brands were all involved with uh, designing the Eat Well Plate. And the original Eat Well Plate had a uh, can of cola on there. Um, and when they were asked why this was on there, uh, they said, no, it's not, because we all know the cola is not healthy. Um, they have since taken it off. And I have that image as well. That is available on the podcast with Zoe Harcombe, if, if you want to take a look at that. I won't pull that one out now. Um, but the one that I do want you to see in regard to this... Um, can, I, can I say something, Rich, before you pull that Anyway, up? you do that while I pull this up, yeah. Because they're at school... Um... Some of the arguments might might be lost, the new ones might be lost, but you could also say, well, humans have always been eating this for about 350,000 years. They've been eat, eating meat. They haven't been eating cereal. They certainly haven't been eating fruit and veg because up until 500 years ago, there wasn't even an orange. We have been hybridizing or making new types of fruit and veg, nothing like they used to be. Uh, you never see a cave painting of anyone eating a salad Right. So, you know, we know that humans have always eaten meat, animal uh, flesh and protein. And um, whenever they do archaeology digs, they find the long bones and the teeth of humans. And they've always eaten, science has proven this, always eaten at least 80% animal products. So we've always eaten this for 350,000 years. And um, only 10,000 years ago, we started agriculture. I've nearly finished. We started agriculture 10,000 years ago. You're going to learn this, that humans settled and started to grow their own fruit and veg. And from that moment on, humans have got smaller, uh, they're shorter, and their brain capacity has got worse, and their teeth have got worse. And that's all proven in fossil records. So fruit and veg has made us smaller, shorter, dumber, and uglier. <laughs> so that might cut some ice with some 14-year-olds. And that's proven. That's absolutely proven. One hundred percent. It's an evolutionary appropriate diet, isn't it? Um, and just to come back to that, the, the the reason that most vegans and vegetarians will confer a benefit, and I'll say it again, so you can hear it this time, Steve, um, is because it's because it's in spite of, and not because of. And by that, what I mean is, if you are beginning a journey, let's say you're waking up tomorrow, and I want to be super fit and healthy, I'm going to become a vegan because I believe that that is healthy. Um, so you stop eating animal proteins, but now you've also stopped buying um, takeaways and McDonald's and Burger King and Domino's. Um, these fast foods contain toxic compounds in the form of an oil called linoleic acid, which causes insulin resistance, glycation and oxidative stress, which is directly linked with ill health. So by default, you've removed all of these toxins. Now you're, 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 um, you're actively trying to be fitter and healthier. So now you're taking more care in in yourself and what you're doing, uh, you may be you may join a gym, you might start walking, you may start running or doing all these things. You're making positive changes in your life. So now you become healthier because of the things that you've you're changing and the things that you've removed, but it isn't it isn't because you're eating more fruits and vegetables. Um, fruits and vegetables, contrary to popular belief, are not as nutrient dense as we are led to believe. And again, this is a fact, you can Google it. Um my goodness, where was I going with that? Um, fruits and vegetables. <laughs> Got lost in, in my own trailer thought. Let's go back to the vegetable oil thing. 
the vegetable oil thing that we're told is good for us, this this oil that is high in linoleic acid. If you were to Google this, um, and Google it now if you want to, a, a condition called cytosterolemia, S-I-T-O, sterolemia, just type <laughs> cytosterolemia. This is an inherited condition that is uh, where the sufferer loses their ability to detox, to remove phytosterols from vegetable oils, and it leads to a massive increase in cardiovascular disease. Um, yet we are told that these do the opposite. And this condition tells us in black and white cytosterolemia that the excessive amounts of these toxic compounds will lead to early death. So we're, remo- we're removing these. But now we're eating more fruits and vegetables. We're more active, so we're healthier in spite of. Um, fruits and veg are not as nutrient dense as we're led to believe. And, and again, and I just remembered where I was going, this is a fact. All vegetables contain phytoalexins, plant toxins. And I'm not saying not to eat vegetables or fruits by any means, but an animal can run away. An animal can fight back. They have a defense mechanism. Plants are rooted to the ground and their defense mechanism is in a compound called phytosterols. All plants contain these and there's hundreds and thousands of them and we're discovering new ones all the time. Um, these are compounds that will cause issues in the body. Ones that we know of are lectins. Lectins will cause intestinal permeability. Oxalates will cause things like arthritic pains, um, uh, thyroid issues, uh, even breast cancer, so on and so forth. Liver issues, kidney problems. These compounds are found in, in, in vegetables in excess. But you're living the lifestyle. You're thriving. And vegetables, uh, vegans and vegetarians will notice a uh, an improvement to the point up until maybe five or six years where the body has used up its store of cobalamin or vitamin B12. The body will store cobalamin in the liver and it becomes like a reserve tank and we can tap in for that and it will last a number of years. This is why when you become a vegan, we're absolutely thriving. And then uh, as a good friend of mine, Mikey, who I trained with, who is an incredible Ironman athlete, who was a vegan, he came to see me because he just his performance started to dip. He became unwell. He was injuring a lot. Um, he'd use he'd used up his cobalamin levels, his heme iron levels were, were tanked. When he started introducing animal proteins, now he's become even a better athlete. All of these other ailments have gone away. Um, and if you don't believe me in regards to the nutrient density uh, in in plants compared to animal proteins, am I sharing the screen there, Steve? I can't tell. You are. You are yeah. sharing the screen. Fantastic. So on the left, we have amino acid profile uh, in in beef compared to kidney beans as a representation. Amino acids, when we consume proteins, animal proteins like chicken or beef, they're broken down into amino acids. These amino acids are then reconstituted into human DNA, human proteins, which allow us to heal and repair every cell in the body. We need amino acids to do this. Animal proteins contain far more of these amino acids in more bioavailable amounts. So animal proteins get a tick on this. But let's go on to the vitamin and mineral profile. If we look to the right-hand side, and I know some of you guys in the chat have seen this before, this looks at two so-called superfoods, blueberries and kale. Uh, And then we have listed on the left vitamin A down to zinc. And what we can see is the the amount of vitamins and minerals within this compared to ribeye, beef liver, fish roe eggs, and basically animal proteins. Just by looking at that list, you can see that most of the nutrients are found to the right-hand side of that line. But there's a caveat to this also because blueberries and kale, 100 grams of kale is quite a lot of kale. You wouldn't, you, you may eat 100 grams, but it's quite a lot. But you wouldn't eat 100 grams of beef. You're more likely to eat 500 grams of beef. You know, so the numbers to the right-hand side of that line can comfortably be multiplied by pick a number and it depends how how big that you like you know you know your chicken breast and and your beef and lamb and so on and so forth but if we look at this plants do not contain vitamin a no plant contains vitamin a we are told that carrots are a good source your, your mum will tell you to eat carrots to see in the dark at least my mum did carrots do not contain vitamin a plants contain a precursor called beta carotene beta carotene uh, is then acted upon by an enzyme called bcmo which then converts it into the active form of retinol. But in order to create retinol, which is true vitamin A, it's depleted by nearly 21 times. So there's no vitamin A in plants. Thiamine B1, trace amounts. Riboflavin B2, niacin B3. Niacin, these these are compounds that are essential for life. Uh, Vitamin B6, pyridoxine, next to nothing. Biotin B7, almost nothing. Folate, yes, but then there's there's way more folate in an egg. 
way more for it than an egg. This is why a vegetarian um, is healthier than a vegan because they're consuming eggs. They're consuming lots of other compounds that uh, that a vegan wouldn't be. Uh, vitamin D, there's no vitamin D in plants. Uh, vitamin E, very low, far higher in animal proteins. Vitamin K, there's no vitamin K in plants. If you pick up and, and test this, you can go and try this, pick up a pack of kale in the supermarket, there will be a stamp on there that says good source or high source of vitamin K. There is zero vitamin K in kale. Zero. And again, I'm not lying. You can search this up. Kale contains vitamin K1. The human body needs vitamin K2. Yes, it contains K, vitamin K, but it contains plant vitamin K, not human vitamin K. We need K2. We can't use vitamin K1. Uh, creatine, choline, carnitine, carnosine. These are all compounds that we can only get in, in adequate quantities from animal proteins. And even the biggest argument that I, I get from people in regards to fruits and veggies, vitamin C. Vitamin C is found in animal proteins and in far higher quantities than we're led to believe. Um, a 12 ounce rump steak will contain around 12 milligrams uh, or micrograms, sorry, of um, yeah, milligrams. I am right. Milligrams of, of vitamin C. Uh, what else is on there? Beef liver, 25. You know, so there's, there's a lot of vitamin C found in animal proteins, yet we are told that there's none in there. The interesting thing with vitamin C is it competes for absorption uh, through the GLUT4 transporter with glucose, which means when you consume less sugar, less carbohydrate, the body needs less vitamin C because it now it, it absorbs more. So it doesn't matter which way that you spin this. Animal uh, proteins are by, are by far more nutrient dense. And just to tie this up in a nice little ribbon, when we're told that red meat is saturated fat, go and search that. Find a nutritional profile, a proper scientific trial that looks at the fat profile in beef. Um, monosaturated is predominant in beef. If we look at a piece of beef, two, less than 2% or around 2% of the weight of that beef is saturated fat. There's 7% of the fat in there total and only 2% of that is is actually saturated fats. So they're not, there aren't even that many saturated fats in the foods that we're told is saturated fats in. So the whole argument becomes undone because there, there are far more of the fats that they say are healthier found in these animal proteins than we are led to believe. It doesn't matter which way you spin on it. Animal proteins contain everything that we need, not just to survive, but thrive. Take a breath. <laughs> are you there? You're still there, everybody. That's good. Um, so if she remembers everything there. It's on the playback. It'll be on yes. the playback. Yeah, oh, you beat me to it. Uh, that'd be great. But if not, it's on the playback. It's all there. You can pick and choose the bits that you want. The, the playback will be on the um, website, the community school community website tomorrow. Okay. So, uh, Rich, did you want to sum up? Did you want to announce anything? Um, just like to thank everybody for coming and supporting. Um, again, we've got that 24-hour carnivore-a-thon coming up on July the 7th. And just to reiterate what, what this is, Stephen and I are both live for a full 24 hours. We are physically, we don't take in turns. We're both live for a full 24 hours with guests coming on every hour. Um, so you get to, to to watch us, if you know, should you wish to do so for, for longer. Uh, and you get to ask questions to some of your favorite um, carnivore or nutrition experts. Um, they, last year, there were tons of questions. It was incredibly popular. So uh, as one of the paid features through the school community, um, Steve's going to put a little post up. If you have any questions for any of the speakers, um, then you know the, the, the paid community will be able to put them in and prioritize the question. Anybody can ask questions on the day. Uh, but if you want to guarantee that the question is answered by your favorite spokesperson, which is obviously Stephen and I, but still, <laughs> if, if you know Anthony Chafee tickles the bells for you, then uh, you know you can preference your question there, or you can join the live and ask it there. Um, but it, that's going to be fantastic. Stephen and I are live for a full twenty-four hours, so any of you um, who want to come and, and watch and support that, then is uh, would be massively uh, appreciated. Have I missed anything, Steve? No, no, that's absolutely fine. I think that's fabulous. So I'm glad everyone turned up. Thank you so much for listening to my podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. Your support means the absolute world to me. And if you're enjoying the show, I've got a small favour to ask you. 
I'd be incredibly grateful if you would consider becoming a supporter and make a small monthly donation. Your contribution will really help to improve the show. I'll be able to improve the software, maybe put a few more episodes out and do many things that I'm hoping to do in the future. Do them a lot quicker. So it's a small monthly contribution. You can cancel at any time and the link is in the show notes. Thanks very much for listening.